Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. With a wealth of knowledge and over 30 years of experience in risk management, performance optimization, and health and safety, Pat Byrne is the expert on improving worker safety or boosting athletic performance. Pat's fatigue management system, using state-of-the-art knowledge and technology, have proven to be successful. Clients have included the U.S. Department of Defense, Harvard Medical School, major mining and transportation companies, and leading sports teams in the National Hockey League, National Football League, National Basketball Association, Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, Major League Football League, and national soccer programs, as well as the National Olympic Committees. A lot of experience. Pat, firstly, thank you so much for coming on and welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thank you. So today, I just want to delve into all things about sleep, and there seems to be so much hype about sleep at the moment. Can you give us your perspective on on how important it really is, maybe by telling us how much we actually need and how much time maybe even taking off our lives by not getting enough? Sure. Maybe I'll just kind of backtrack a little bit because sleep has been hyped a lot, and it's obviously a very important function. The way I look at it is it's not just something we do. It is a critical brain function. I kind of look at it much like breathing, where we have some control. We can, you know, usually play this kid's game, how long can I hold my breath for? But at some point, your brain kicks in and says, sorry, I need oxygen and forces you to start breathing. And sleep is very much the same way. So you have some control over your sleep. You can stay up all night if you want. You can restrict your sleep, but at some point your brain will say, sorry, I need sleep, and you'll just fall asleep. So that's what happens with people, whether you're you know, flying a plane or driving a car or a transport truck, people just fall asleep because your brain controls when you sleep. You have some control over it, but your brain controls it. So that's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about how that affects our health and safety and how it affects our performance as athletes. And there's some human variability, but somewhere between seven and a half and nine hours of sleep every night. And that depends on your age, largely, and some human variability. And it's not just the duration of sleep that's critical, but it's the quality of the sleep. That's where people kind of end up falling apart. You know, I know a lot of athletes who end up, quite frankly, using alcohol (laughs) to fall asleep after games. And so what happens is they become unconscious, but the alcohol really messes up their sleep patterns. And so they're actually unconscious for maybe eight hours, but they're probably lucky to get five hours of good sleep out of that. Right. So it's almost, would you say then, quality over quantity? Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a lot of research that shows that the quality of sleep is much more important than the duration. The difficulty is sleep is such a new science, and most people don't know that because it's splashed across the news constantly. But it's a very, very new science. In fact, if you think about this back in 1953, which was the year I was born, um, the entire sequence of DNA and the structure of DNA was discovered and published. And it was well known, sort of Watson and Crick work, and that's kind of expanded. But it was like six months after I was born before sleep research even started. And it wasn't until probably in the last decade that we really started to look at how sleep affects human performance. And so there's been a lot of catch-up work to be done. And there's a lot of good research out there, and there's a lot of not-so-good research out there. And it's pretty hard to kind of sift through all that. Absolutely. And you're right. And obviously in the media, they like to hype it up a bit. But one thing you mentioned, seven and a half to nine hours sleep, and it depends on age. How does it depend? For Most of the athletes are kind of on the verge of being either adolescents or teenagers and adults. And the human brain isn't fully developed till 24, 25. And so adolescents have what's called adolescent brain, (laughs) for lack of better words. Their circadian rhythm and their sleep patterns are quite a bit different. They require quite a bit more sleep, usually around nine or 10 hours of sleep. And their circadian rhythms are different. So typically teenagers will stay up late and sleep in in the morning. And it's not because they're lazy. It's because that's what their biology and their brain demands. The problem, of course, is that we treat teenagers as if they're adults, whether they're the time they go to school 
or the time they get up and practice for sports, and we don't really respect their biology. But once they, you know, get past 24, 25, and they mostly swing into an adult brain, then they're into sort of a more natural circadian rhythm. And, you know, most people go to sleep later in the evening and then get up at a decent time. And then again, once you get older, people like me, everything starts to break apart in your body eventually, as does your sleep architecture. So older people need, you know, seven and a half to nine hours of sleep, but they can't get it because their brain doesn't let them get that amount of sleep in one block. So they tend to get up earlier and nap in the afternoons, which are a good thing, but they still need the seven and a half to nine hours of sleep. They're just not getting it. And you say the brain controls that. Why, as we get older, does the brain not allow us to sleep longer? Ah, good question. Probably the same reason the brain makes our hair turn white <laughs> or fall out <laughs> and our skin turn <laughs> wrinkled. We, we just age. Right? right. And our body just breaks down. That's just part of our natural biology. Okay. So if our brain controls our sleep and we ignore that, say, for example, in my instance, doing an eight-day adventure race where the idea is actually not to sleep in order to get through as quick as possible, or maybe it's just you're a pilot or even an athlete and you're traveling a lot and you need to actually stay awake for whatever reason, and we ignore that signal for a certain amount of time, what are the effects? So what happens if you're not getting this sort of seven and a half to nine hours of sleep, then there's actually a measurable change in a number of factors. One is your reaction time, which is your simple reaction time and even your more complex reaction time. But a lot of the research has been around simple reaction time. And the less you sleep, even if you slept five hours last night, for example, your reaction time this next day is actually measurably worse. There are short-term effects of sleep deprivation or sleep restriction, as some people call it which is largely reaction time, your ability to concentrate, your ability to focus. And then there's sort of longer term effects, which is a lot of the health effects, increases in obesity, increases in diabetes, and sort of inability to learn and to retain information, which is really important. For example, football players in the National Football League in North America, they have hundreds of plays they have to learn and retain into their brain. And if they're not sleeping, you can't retain that information. It's the same with students. There's some really good studies done out of the U.S. military that shows the difference between six hours of sleep on a regular basis and eight hours of sleep on a regular basis is about 12% difference in grades. Wow, that's quite significant, isn't it? But there's subtle differences, and so people kind of get used to that, and that's what's sort of insidious about sleep loss. You know, people start to think that starts to become this sort of new normal mm. just because it's so insidious, but it's measurable. Interesting. And you mentioned just before about naps. There seems to be different schools of thought on that. And like you mentioned, the media likes to hype things up. What are the, the myths out there about sleep and maybe some even facts that we might be surprised about that you might know about? Think about naps for a minute. Naps are sleep. They're a bit like coffee, right, and the caffeine. So there are good times to take it and bad times to take it. I mean, you don't want to start wolfing down coffee and Red Bull, you know, the hour before you need to go to sleep. It's going to affect your sleep. But there are times during the day, perhaps early afternoon or in the morning, where it's pretty good for you. Naps are exactly the same way. They need to be taken strategically. You don't want to be napping, you know, a couple hours before you would normally want to go to sleep because then your brain is built up to sleep and it's much more difficult to get to sleep. But it's really great. Most of the professional athletes that I've worked with, both in North America and in Australia, tend to nap in the afternoons. And what that does is builds up their sleep bank and actually helps with their reaction time during games, particularly when they play evening games. So napping is great as long as it's done strategically. Right. Okay. And so mornings or afternoons then perhaps are the best time. And is that the case with anyone, even from young infants to older, say, nanny naps, as they call them? Yeah, absolutely. Our body has sort of natural circadian rhythms and natural you know, rises and falls. And usually in the early afternoon is what's called post-lunch dip. People often get tired after lunch, one or two o'clock, and they think it's because of all the past that they had for lunch. And in fact, that's actually a natural dip in our circadian rhythm. And that's usually a good time to nap. And a lot of cultures actually do that, particularly in, you know, in the Mediterranean areas and others, people have naturally have naps in the afternoon. And you mentioned the media often comes out with some interesting statements about sleep. What are the things that you're most surprised about? 
it's really the technology, I think. I think they hype a lot of technology that's largely unproven. They tend to hype studies that, you know, maybe involve half a dozen people, right? <laughs> and so because sleep research is so new, then the press is interested in it. So they'll publish pretty much anything and hype just about anything. Particularly a lot of these gadgets that you can buy these days that pretend to measure your sleep, a lot of them are just garbage, quite frankly. <laughs> and, you know, people shouldn't believe a lot of the hype and the bling that they get. So they get something on their wrists and then something pops up on their phone and says they've gotten, you know, 4.5 hours of sleep and so much REM sleep and so much deep cycle sleep. It's impossible to measure sleep from your wrist. I worked with a professor at Stanford University a while back and, and he said, look, sleep is in the brain and your brain's not on your wrist. <laughs> So, Pat, is there actually any effective device out there that you would recommend or even sort of use yourself? There are, but it's a question of understanding what the data means and what it looks like. So the wristwatches that port to measure sleep come in two categories. There are what are called consumer-grade sleep watches or actographs and medical-grade sleep watches or actographs. And so the way you actually measure sleep is with what's called polysomnography. So polysomnography is you go into a hospital bed and they put electrodes all over your head and your body and they measure your brain waves. Okay, so they can actually tell based on your brain waves when you're asleep and when you're awake. That's not very convenient for athletes. So what they've done with these sleep watches is tried to create some algorithms that mimics what polysomnography will actually do. The medical grade actographs are about 90 to 95 percent accurate in predicting when you're asleep and when you're awake. It cannot tell you anything else about your sleep except whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. The consumer grade actographs, because they're so cheap, I mean, buying for probably $100, have never been tested. So they don't put them through the testing, they're guessing at it because they're cheap. People use them and wear them. And they don't know what to do with the data. I've had lots of athletes who have phoned me up and said, oh, you know, I've got this watch and it's telling me I'm not getting enough REM sleep. What do I do? And I just started laughing. Who goes to bed at night and goes, yeah, maybe I'll get a bit more REM sleep tonight? You know? <laughs> that's, that's a good <laughs> point. Your brain, your, your brain decides what sleep you need. And I guess more to the point, the medical actographs don't even measure what is actually REM sleep. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. They can measure if you're rolling around at night and moving around at night, and they can measure largely when you're awake and when you're asleep, but that's the total limit of that technology. So how then would you use and what would you use for an athlete? I use medical grade oxygraphs. For athletes, there's really three reasons why people aren't sleeping well enough. And one is their natural biology. So that includes things like sleep disorders, right? Mental disorders and organic diseases. Then there are what I like to call lifestyle issues, and I don't particularly mean that in a negative way, but the conscious decisions we make about and choices we make while we're awake. You know, whether you have children, how far you live from work, what kind of work you do, do you stay up late, watch movies? So all of the choices that you make can affect your sleep. The third reason is really your work and your work schedule, or if you're an athlete, your travel schedule. So I've done a lot of work over the last decade in the National Hockey League and the National Basketball Association, where they play 82 games in a season, you know, 41 on the road, 41 at home, and a lot of back-to-back -back games. The way that the league schedule the games have an effect on, on their sleep. So what we try to do is figure out, when we work with individual athletes or teams, what's causing them not to sleep properly. Is it the scheduling? Is it a biological issue or is it a lifestyle issue? And so what we do is we use these medical grade actographs and we use questionnaires as well. We try to sort through all of those questions. And sometimes it's not just one thing or the other, but it's a combination. So we try to sort through that. And we worked recently with, a, you know, like a world class athlete. And turns out, you know, all of his sleep problems was really an organic disease he had. So it wasn't his lifestyle issues. It wasn't the scheduling. That's how we try to do it. We look at it. And then once you know what the cause of it is, then you can try to start fashioning solutions. Unfortunately, what a lot of athletes do is try to jump into solutions without understanding what the problem is. Sure. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So once you determine the cause, let's say, for right. example, in this case, it was a lifestyle issue. 
How then would you get the athlete themselves to regularly measure their sleep performance? Would you actually get them to come in and, and use a medical actigraph all the time? Or in the cases where you can't have access to one of those, how would the athlete measure it? What we use is technology from a company called Fatigue Science. And, and full disclosure, I founded the company 12 years ago. I retired from for the last three years, so I'm not involved in the management or have anything to do with the company, but the technology itself has evolved. So for example, when I work with athletes, what we do is we ship them a medical grade actigraph and they just wear it and it syncs with their phone. And then I get real time data on my computer in my office from them, no matter where they are in the world. So I can monitor them and it's all obviously very private and you know very confidential and then we get on the phone like on skype or on the phone with them and we talk to them about you know you didn't get to sleep at three o'clock in the morning in in sydney last night what's going on <laughs> right Excellent. right so that sort of thing and so if it's a lifestyle issue we can help them with some of that if it's a biological issue we try to figure out there are like 90 different sleep disorders and so we may send them to various clinics or whatever to get that sorted out to help them move forward with that and the same with some of the organic diseases and certainly on the scheduling side of things for example for teams what we try to do is get them to particularly late night games these guys are you know having 20 or 30,000 people screaming at them for hours and then they get off the ice or off the court and then they try to get to sleep and they can't get to sleep and then they've got a game the next day we have different psychologists that we work with that help them with various techniques to try to get to sleep on time. We work with the teams in terms of helping them travel smarter so that they can get the players better sleep. Once you understand what the problem is, then there's a whole variety of solutions that we can implement. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to go a bit more into those solutions. But before we do, I just wanted to confirm with you then, obviously, if I'm a professional athlete, I can work with you directly. And that's ideal. But a lot of our listeners are, say, semi-pros. They do have sleep mm. issues. They've bought themselves an aura ring or something similar. Are they wasting their time? Or is there some way that these type of devices, and if so, which ones could help? Yeah, that's difficult because, so there are two issues here. One is, is the information even accurate? That's what's, I think, scary about the consumer grade technology. What I always encourage them to do is go to the manufacturer and say, show me the validation papers. Why isn't this published on your website? Quite frankly, I mean, all they have to do is to compare what polysomnography says against what the ring or the thing under their bed or whatever they're wearing does, you know, in terms of measuring sleep. They need to go to the corporate website or email them and say, send me your validation papers. Show me this is accurate against polysomnography. It's dead simple. And the second part of it is, even if it is accurate, because it can't really measure sleep quality. So people are sometimes beating themselves up in terms of sleep duration and really struggle with trying to understand what the data means and to do something about it. Most of that technology is designed for people who have what I call lifestyle issues. So it completely ignores, you know, medical issues, completely ignores scheduling issues. All it does is it assumes that you have a lifestyle issue and so you need to control the hours of sleep you get by using their technology. Yeah, so what, in your experience, is the breakup of those three causes in terms of disorders, lifestyle, and work? Which seems to be the most likely cause with your athletes? Quite frankly, we see a combination. The biology is actually a much bigger area than people appreciate. There's huge mental health issues in professional sports. I know Australia is doing some work around that right now. So the whole biological side gets ignored, and I think that wouldn't surprise me if it was like a third of the problems. Certainly, athletes have gotten better over the last decade in terms of lifestyle issues, in terms of trying to get better sleep, trying to go to bed more consistently, trying to get seven and a half to nine hours of sleep. They're good at that. And some of the scheduling, the schedulers are getting better. The National Basketball Association is starting to make the season a bit longer so the players don't have so many back-to-back -back games. A lot of the way games have been scheduled in all the leagues is just based on history and the way they've always done things. And they're just slowly starting to introduce science into it and try to make some tweaks to it. For a lot of the athletes that I work with that do have sleep problems, it's, I would say, probably only about 10% is really lifestyle issues anymore. And a lot of it's biological and a lot of it's just scheduling issues. 
a lot of the teams that I've worked with have the best athletes on the teams I've worked with have always been the best sleepers. The vast majority of the players, particularly in the National Hockey League and NBA, the bottom third of the sleepers are usually gone within a few years. Mm, that's interesting. And, right. And so what I say to the teams, I said, this isn't necessarily a lifestyle issue, but you need to get all these players sleep tested. You're going to be losing some really good athletes because they're not performing very well, because they're not sleeping very well. But you really haven't drilled down and figure out why not. Like It's left to the devices of the individual athlete to figure that out, and they're struggling with that. Can you give us an example of how you've helped athletes' performance, obviously without mentioning names, maybe just the cause and then how you went about changing? My background's really in occupational health and safety, and I've worked a lot in industry, the U.S. military with a special ops command. I've worked in Caterpillar help them design systems. I've worked a lot in Western Australia in Pilbara with Rio Tinto. My background is in really trying to prevent fatigue-related accidents. But in 2008, the Vancouver Canucks and the National Hockey League came to me, they're in our hometown here, and they said, you know, we have really severe travel problems because we're on the West Coast and we're constantly having to fly West Coast to East Coast. If you've traveled, you understand traveling West to East is way harder on your sleep and on your biological rhythms than it is going east to west. Their nearest city, I think, is 400 miles away, you know, versus teams in New York where they can hop on a subway and play the next team, or they're only an hour flight away. And so they came to me and said, look, we think we have probably the worst travel schedule in North America. And so what can we do about it? And so we started looking at it. And so my idea was, look, let's just measure the player's sleep for two or three weeks on the entire team. Let's see what their sleep patterns look like. Let's see how much of this is biology, how much is this is travel. So we went through that process. and The players were wonderful about it. What we discovered was that particularly when they went on East Coast road trips, so they would go from Vancouver, say, to New York and Florida, and they'd go to Colorado. They would bounce all over the place. And so what we discovered was two things. One, that when they would end a road trip, and some of these are like six or seven games they would go on the road for, for sometimes two weeks at a time, they would end the games in on the East Coast, often in New York or Boston. And they would, after the game, they would fly back to Vancouver. So they wouldn't get into Vancouver till four or five o'clock in the morning. And so they lost a lot of sleep doing that. And it would take them, you know, at least three nights of good sleep to try to catch up on that. And if they had a game within that window, they often lost those games. In fact, there was a folklore joke in Vancouver that the Canucks always lost their first home game after a road trip. And so we figured out why that was. And so what we did was we suggested that they actually stay in their last city, New York or Boston, get some sleep and then fly back the next day. It worked out really well. In fact, now most National Hockey League and NBA teams have adopted that practice. So that eliminated a lot of the fatigue after they got home. And the other issue was that the league had them bouncing back and forth between different time zones when they were on road trips. So they would go to the you know East Coast time zone, then Central, and then Mountain, and back and forth. And so the data we presented to the National Hockey League showed that how that was a problem, how that was affecting the player's sleep. And so now, if you look at your schedule, when the Canucks go on road trips, they all go to one time zone, play their games in that time zone, and then come back home again. So there are sort of team solutions, as well as we work with individual athletes and solve some of their own individual issues along the way. But just to give you an idea how successful that team was, they went from having one of the worst road records of any team in the National Hockey League to winning what's called President's Trophy, which is a championship two years in a row and having the best road record of any team in the National Hockey League two years in a row. And Pat, was that simply by just changing the schedule or did you change yeah. other things like where they were sleeping? And We did a little bit around what's called sleep environment in terms of making sure they had proper blackout blinds. And back in those days, they actually had roommates. The players who had sleep issues got their own room so they weren't waking up the other players. <laughs> right? They all get their own rooms now. That part of it's changed. So we did some of that. We made sure the rooms were dark and quiet and in the quiet parts of the hotel. We made sure that the coach didn't get them up early for meetings. You know, we trained the coaches and the training staff as well as the players. And the players that had sleep issues, we got them into proper clinics, got their issues dealt with, and we counseled them. And so there was a whole combination of things. But the vast majority, for, at least for that team, was a team solution in terms of when they travel and when they slept. 
Mm. And I enjoyed your article in the Daily Mail on the 23rd of December, and I'll, I'll link to that, the air travel and its effects on the athletic performance. So that was really interesting, and I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. One thing mm. I wanted to sort of delve into a bit, it seems like lifestyle and work causes you seem to be able to make significant changes and obviously prove these changes through performance. I guess sleep disorders, you sort of mentioned that you sort of send mm. them to people that can help what in your experience are these sleep disorders and what would you recommend if our listeners have been diagnosed with one of these Mm. disorders what to do sure well there are about 90 different recognized sleep disorders and sort of the (laughs) yeah sorry (laughs) some of them are quite rare but you know things like restless leg syndrome or sleep apnea and there are different forms of sleep apnea are quite common Depending on the the kind of sleep disorder, there are different solutions for restless leg syndrome, for example. Basically, your legs shake and you can't sleep and you wake up all the time. There's medications that treat that pretty rapidly. Same if you have obstructive sleep apnea. There are CPAP machines and other ways to get it treated. There are treatments for the vast majority of sleep disorders. Certainly, it depends on the sport and depends on the athlete. National Football League, for example, they have a fairly high proportion of sleep apnea on linemen because obesity is, you know, one of the causes of sleep apnea. And so you have these, you know, 350 pound players, they struggle with sleep apnea and there've been players that have died from it. You know, what we do initially is sift the ground here and kind of go, you know, we think that this is partly a lifestyle issue and let's put some framework around that and help you with that part of it. We think part of this might be biological, so we have some questionnaires. We go through people and and then point them into the right direction and hold their hand through that process, and then they come back and they've got it fixed, and then we go back and actually show them through the medical-grade actographs that their sleep is better. And certainly on the scheduling side of it, we work with the teams and leagues and try to make it easier for the athletes to get the sleep they need. So often I see athletes and just anyone, and especially with certain work issues, say, for example, pilots are a good one where obviously their sleep is very irregular. And Mm. I see them taking supplements or drugs. What Mm. role do you think that plays in managing sleep or would you avoid those altogether? Yeah, I don't believe in better living through chemistry. I have used sleep drugs myself because I've been to Australia probably a dozen times or more working. And with the overnight flight, sometimes you need to have something knock you out. But you can plan through that as well as just not take drugs and and just have longer to recover when you get there. I think they're more common in certainly in North American professional sports. And people admit a lot of the players privately admit to me they take it. But, you know, they can be addictive. And there's some good research out that shows that the kind of sleep you get with sleeping pills is not the same good quality sleep that you get naturally. Again, this goes to the whole newness of sleep research. So, you know, the drug companies that produce sleeping pills that say this will put you to sleep and go, oh, good, I'll take it without really knowing whether the sleep is good quality or not. Mm. And what is good quality sleep? Good quality sleep, well, there's sort of idealized sleep. And so when we sleep, we go through different phases. And so you start off sort of drifting off and you go into a deeper and deeper and deeper sleep. And so they named those stage one, two, three, four sleep. If you look at the brain waves, you can see what stage of sleep they're in. After you go through a deep sleep, then you come back up into a lighter sleep, and then you go into what's called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. It's when your eyes rapidly move and your brain waves look exactly like the brain waves as if you were wide awake. And so there's always a lot of debate about whether REM sleep is real sleep or not, but it's when we dream. And it's all stages of sleep are important. And each one of those cycles is around 90 minutes, an hour and a half. And so if you can go through sort of five of those cycles in a night, then that's pretty good sleep. The difficulty people have understanding is that cycles are not all made the same. So in one night, if you go through five cycles, the first cycle you go through is going to look different than the last cycle. Because as you go through each cycle, you gain more and more rapid eye movement sleep. There are consultants out there that talk about, oh, just don't worry about the hours of sleep, just count the number of cycles you get, which is completely bad advice in my my view, because all cycles are not the same. 
And so what happens if you're only getting six hours versus eight hours of sleep, for example, you could be missing out on the vast majority of the REM sleep because it's all back-ended on your sleep. And would that then be detrimental, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Your brain is meant to go through these full five cycles every night. So if you don't, then you pay a price for it. There's a health price you pay, there's a safety price you pay, and there's a performance price you pay for it if you don't do that. So let's say, for example, you go one, two, three, and you don't get to number four because you've only slept, say, three Mm. hours. Right. You don't get to number four, and then you do the same again. And then so number four and REM sleep, you're just totally missing out on. And then when you go and have a nap in the afternoon, presumably you're still not getting to that number four. Yeah, absolutely. You don't. Your brain starts over once you're awake. You know, it's really interesting because when the studies on people that are massively sleep deprived, keeping people awake for 24 or 48 hours, for example, when they fall asleep, their brain puts them into deep sleep and keeps them into deep sleep much longer than they would normally. So your brain will compensate in terms of which cycles and which stage of sleep you need. And so we shouldn't be trying to mess with our brains. Right? <laughs> what we should be doing is complementing or helping our brain and finding time in our schedules to get a window of you know seven and a half to nine hours where we can actually get sleep. So what you're saying then is is if your body needs more of that number four, for example, would it Mm. take you through one, two, and three quicker in order to get to number four? It might. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. (laughs) I'm I'm trying to simplify it here for my my brain. But your your brain will decide, and we have no way to control that. And so what I'm saying is from a conscious athletic decision, the best thing you can do, and practically the only thing you can really do is to carve out time to get the sleep that you need and let your brain do the rest. Got you. Maybe you could give some advice to our listeners. Let's say we've got some listeners out there who are taking sleeping pills, say, three times a week, and they're taking maybe melatonin every now and then as well in order to get sleep so that they can function the next day. What advice would you give them? I ask them the same questions that I ask all the athletes is, why are you doing that? You know, go back to my three things. Are you doing this because it's a lifestyle issue? Is this a scheduling issue so you can't get to sleep after games or practices? Are you masquerading as a sleep disorder or a biological condition? Sleeping pills are in the category of remedies for certain problems. And people take them because they can't sleep without really understanding what the problem is. And so I always kind of go back to the beginning and say, well, why are you doing this? Let's figure out what the problem is, and is there another way to solve the problem besides taking sleeping pills? And then presumably they can go and see a sleep specialist if there is a disorder. But let's say they decide that, no, it's definitely a lifestyle or a work issue. What advice would you give them then? Well, they need to sit down and figure out, like athletes and everyone else in life, they have to make priorities. And so, you know, what's your priority at this point? Is it, you know, if, if sleep's a priority for you, then there are some adjustments you're going to need to make to your life. Why can't you get to sleep when you're supposed to be going to sleep? Is it your bedroom? Is it because you need to stay up late? Is it because you're anxious about the game that you, you're you going to play or the tournament you're going to play in? Like, So what is it that's causing you not to get to sleep? My advice is, you know, try to diagnose that side of it and then think hard about why you think sleeping pills are the answer to that. Yeah, good advice. And is there people that say you you don't actually need to go and see a sleep specialist per se? Who Mm. else could you go and see in terms of the lifestyle work? Would someone like yourself do online appointments? We do. I call it appointment. Then we work with very, very high level athletes. What we do is I say we ship them a a medical grade actigraph. We go through questionnaires with them. We try to sort through what the particular issue may be with them. And then we help them monitor it and give them feedback. So they don't have to be checking the app on their phone or their watch and saying, oh, you know, I only got this much sleep or that much sleep and what's going on and what do I need to do? Because they don't have people that can help them with that. And so we have, you know, some real time access to their data. And I can, you know, push a button on my computer for John Smith and go, okay, well, here's what's going on. You know, how come you didn't get to sleep to one o'clock last night? You know, we can look at how much sleep they've lost and how much sleep they need to sort of catch up. The technology we have has a, a special software program that was developed by the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army that converts sleep data into what we call performance or reaction time data. So we can tell pretty precisely based on your sleep patterns how that's affecting your reaction time. 
what we'll do with athletes is when we monitor their data in real time, we'll say, okay, when's the next important time you need to perform? Is it your next practice, your next game? And then we can say to them, okay, you know, if you continue to sleep this way, you're going to lose 15 or 20% of your reaction time into game time. Here's the kind of lifestyle and the kinds of decisions you need to make ahead of that and the amount of sleep you need ahead of that so that you're at 100% at game time. Perfect. That sounds great. So, Pat, with this type of, I guess you could call it, job that you have, are you able to have several naps throughout the day and, and just sort of claim that you're working? Or <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm a terrible napper. I actually napped today because I, I was up early at 4.30 this morning for family reasons, so lifestyle choices. I'm just not a good napper. So what I do is I try to get into a routine, go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time, and I find that works best for me. Yeah. And the biggest complaint I hear from people is they say they can't sleep. When I delve into why not, it's often because they're actually not spending enough time in bed. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. There's some great studies done out of Stanford. Sherry Ma, who's a, one of the early pioneer researchers and friend of ours, she put medical grade actigraphs on the wrists of some of their best basketball players at Stanford and also asked them to keep a sleep log. So they had to write down when they went into bed and, you know, and how much sleep they thought they got. And after a month of data, she realized that the players were overestimating the amount of sleep they got by seven zero minutes a night. And that's been shown in quite a number of studies that people are very bad at really knowing how much sleep they're actually getting. But the other part of her study that she did was she had the athletes be in bed for 10 hours, and they actually only got eight hours of sleep. Mm, interesting. If you've organized your life around eight hours in bed thinking you're getting it eight hours of sleep, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, you need, you need to schedule a lot more time in bed in order to get the sleep you need. And again, because these things are subtle, is most computer screens, and particularly the smartphone screens, put out a certain blue light, certain wavelengths of blue light that are the absolutely worst for melatonin production in your body. In other words, your brain puts out melatonin when it's dark out to help you get to sleep. It's a sleepy hormone. And when it's light out, your body stops producing it. And so you need this melatonin to help you sleep. And so what happens when people's in front of their computer screens, laying in bed and on their phones, trying to get to sleep, and the blue light is not letting their brains produce melatonin? Yeah, good advice. So would you recommend turning all technology off a couple of hours before sleep? Yeah, at least an hour, mm -hmm. right? Try something different. Go have a bath or read a book, <laughs> you know? Even television is better than, than having your computer or the smartphone in front of your face. Yeah, absolutely. I liked your comment with the AFL team. You're like, no wonder they can't sleep. Their sponsor's Red Bull. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep's a very complex process. And the reasons people aren't getting to sleep in the year is very complex. I see a lot of athletes and other people running around looking for solutions without really drilling down and figuring out what the problem is first. Mm, I like that. I like that you say find out the cause first before you just stick a Band-Aid on it. I really like that. I think that's great advice. Look, Pat, thanks again for all this great advice. And I'm going to put your website and a few articles in the show notes so that people can find out a bit more about you and what you do. But before I let you go today, I would love to ask you a question that we ask all our guests on the show. And that is, do you have a tattoo? No. <laughs> That's a short answer. <laughs> have you ever been uh, inspired to have one or it's not of interest? You know, it's just never been part of the lifestyle of where I grew up. I grew up in northern Canada near the Arctic Circle <laughs> where, you know, in a small town with, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 people where it was minus 40 degrees most of the winter. I never knew anybody who had tattoos. <laughs> I mean, it's not like growing up in New Zealand <laughs> right? or Australia where it's just part of the lifestyle and the culture. I have a master's degree in biochemistry, and so I, I spent a lot of time hanging out with other nerds and scientists who didn't do tattoos. So it was just part of my life experience. I'm not opposed to them, it just has never crossed my mind. <laughs> Excellent. I must say, though, Pat, I do know lots of nerds with tattoos, so I don't <laughs> think that's your excuse. <laughs> <laughs> I, think you've, I think it's in Australia. I think part of it's an age thing and it's a lifestyle thing. Mm. Right? Excellent. Right. Well, thanks for sharing that with us, and thanks again for coming on today. My pleasure. Anytime, Ellie. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. 
If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.